All right, an unusually uh, low number of uh, turnout here tonight, but we do have uh, one person, a nice new face, love to see it. Um, so we're gonna get this thing rolling. And tonight I'm gonna go back, there was a request a while back for uh, the Four Knights defense. So that's what we're gonna go over tonight. And so the Four Knights uh, begins with the moves E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, and now instead of the Roy Lopez or the Spanish or the Italian or even the Scotch, White picks the fourth most popular move, Knight to C3. And I think this is a move that uh, a lot of beginners kind of find on their own. It's uh, the kind of thing that when you just sort of know opening principles, but you don't really know a whole lot of theory, it's something that you might just come up with. So I have several students that, you know, they don't know any theory, but they just sort of discover this on their own. Okay, so yes, yeah, so this is something that uh, you don't see a whole lot at the top level. And uh, one of the reasons is, is because black can uh, really equalize the game in several lines rather comfortably. Um, almost universally, black will play knight to f6. And so here you have it, the four knights. Uh, I wish my, my three-year-old were here so I could confirm, but I believe that those are four knights. Um, so all the knights go to the logical squares, uh, which doesn't really pose black too many immediate problems. A lot of the times when white is getting his bishop out earlier, he's trying to cause some problems before black can get his pieces out in castle. But here normally he won't have any problems uh, developing his pieces. So the, there are a couple of moves here. The most popular moves are bishop to b5, which is the, uh, the Spanish four knights. We'll look at that. There's also the Scotch four knights, which is a close second. And uh, there's even the move g3, the Gleck system. So we'll, we'll take a quick look at that. But I do want to point out one really common mistake that I see a lot, and that's people try to play the Italian four knights. And this is actually a mistake already because uh, black can employ the fork trick. So we only have one person in the audience, but we'll see if he knows the fork trick or if anyone else, all the people training for the camera can help him out. It's knight takes e4. Excellent. Yeah, knight takes e4. So you'll notice in this position, white has two pieces um, that are set up for a pawn fork when there's two pieces next to each other with the space in the middle. Uh, sometimes a pawn can fork them. But here, this wouldn't be a really good fork because you would just be losing your d5 pawn. But by taking first with the knight, you're coaxing uh, the white player into taking back. And now, hopefully, you see the fork, d5. And so this should uh, win some material. And black will end up with a better position. For example, if bishop to d3, black can take. But also, what's funny is he can also not take based on the fact that even if you give white a chance to move this knight away, you can still play e4 on the next move and trap him. So you could play the untested knight to b4, which would be funny. The computer's like, yeah, that's a good move. Uh, you can also play f5, which has been played before, and then e4 next. But OK, most people take the knight. Seems to make a lot of sense. And now uh, you get a position where black has an easy time getting all of his pieces out. That's why he, he can't possibly be worse. And e4 is a really awkward square for this, this bishop. He's, he's not feeling very secure there, so uh, we'll see. And we can just go a couple of moves farther down the line here. Uh, all right, white does have a little threat. He's going to take on c6 with check, and then he's going to take the e pawn. So black usually defends his pawn, and then people castle. And OK, the problem is this is kind of a, a weirdly placed piece, and black gets his pieces out comfortably. So some people when they, they see this position here and somebody does take their e-pawn, they think to themselves, okay, I know that he's going to fork me, so I'm going to take the opportunity to take on f7 with check and misplace your king. Um, this is actually a worse variation for white, so he, he shouldn't go in for this. So you take, and they take your knight. And uh, here, you can just get the really big center with d5, and even if the knight gives you a check. You run away. This is actually significantly better for black. Um, and it might not look that way at first, because you know, you're, you're looking at this king. You think that looks kind of weird. But black already kind of has uh, a lot of ways to get pressure. So if white just casually castles, for example, you can play h6 and follow it up with an immediate bishop to g4. And white is already under tremendous pressure. And this should be really bad for him. And I have a lot of uh, students that. They seem to like to play this 
variation a lot, and I, I can't convince them otherwise. So I, uh, I've shown a lot of my private students six different games from a grandmaster named uh, Afro Mayev. And okay, maybe for one of my beginner breakdowns, when I do beginner breakdown in April, I'll go over Afro Mayev games from this position, because uh, he, he's always, uh, when people played this way, he's always taken, done the fork trick, and people have either taken his knight or taken on f7, and he gets really p good positions, and he's always won, and he's had uh, some games where there are about 20 moves against relatively uh, high-rated grandmasters, so uh, it's not a very, very good way to play. And I have another student that I keep telling him, stop doing this, like, you know it's bad, and she does know, she's like, yeah, I know it's bad, but people never take on e4, so I keep playing it, and I get good positions. So if you're playing absolute beginners, yeah, chances are they're not going to take on e4, and then, yeah, then that's a good move. You'll follow it up with d3, and then life is good. But if black knows what's up, uh, he'll just take on e4. All right. So we'll go back to the, uh, the starting position here. And we'll mention briefly the Gleck system. This is named after Igor Gleck, a grandmaster, who's really made this his own system. It's sort of unusual at first sight, you might think. Okay, you already moved your e-pawn, now you're moving your g-pawn. So the f3 square is, is a little, little tender now. And, uh, you know, you're going to put your bishop here, which might seem strange because you've already put a pawn in the way. But white is anticipating black's future plans. And black is going to play in the center. He'll get this knight out of the way and he'll play c6 and d5 and get some pressure on the center and in the queen side. So he's thinking, by the time you do that, then I'll be able to take on d5 with my pawn, and then my bishop will be looking really good. Also, there's a, there's a lot of different things white can do in this position. Oftentimes, you'll see the knight going to h4, followed by a quick f4. Um, that's very possible. Another common maneuver is uh, you get your pawns on h3 and g4, and the knight comes over to g3, where he's looking at the f5 square. Uh, which would be really nice for a kingside attack. So we'll, we'll take a little look at this here. And, uh, okay, the move d5, that is a possible move here, but the main move is bishop to c5, which seems to make a lot of sense. You just get your, your bishop out, and then you're going to play d6 next. But my question is, you've lined up these pieces, so can't white just do the same thing and do the fork trick? But I'll, I'll, I'll let the audience see if they can play the next couple of moves here. An audience of one is all you need. Okay, the first couldn't move... You, couldn't you play a d6 right away? Get rid of the knight? Right here? Yeah. Okay, and then you're going to let him take this? Oh. Mm, so that didn't quite work. Yeah, the first move is the... Uh, you know, sort of the, the very obvious, right? You, okay, you just take the thing. But now what if d4? Well, you, you'd have a fork on the king and the queen if, if you captured back with the, the bishop there. Mm -hmm. The queen came out. Mm -hmm. You could uh, fork the, uh, the queen and the king with uh, f3. Awesome. Yeah, perfectly said. Um, so yeah, in this variation, because the f3 square was weakened with the move g3, you don't have the fork trick available to you, so very good. Um, yeah, when you, have, when you have one audience member that knows all the answers, it's all you need. Uh, yeah, so the fork trick does not work here for white. But after bishop to g2, now he is thinking about the fork trick. So if you castles, knight takes e5 is a fine move to play. But black has time here just to uh, protect. So again, now uh, white could easily castle here, or you might think about playing the move d3. And the most accurate move here is actually to play d3. And I have a lot of students when I show them this position and they say, well, shouldn't you just castle, you know, castle early, castle often. We even have an expression for this. Um, but you're in no immediate danger. The reason for the always castling as soon as you can rule is because some beginners, they don't castle and then their king gets mated in the center. In this position, you know, black has no way to open up the center immediately and you are one move away from castling if that becomes an issue in the future. But the move d3 sets up a small positional threat. Um, white is going to try to get a small advantage after this move by playing the move knight to a4 and trying to get the bishop pair. So that's why d3 makes the most sense. Um, so black will usually play a6 so that now you have a retreat square. And yeah, so the game will just follow sort of normally now. 
Um, we can even throw in a couple more moves. These things seem to happen. And we can just talk about the, the basic plans and strategies here. Um, so yeah, often this bishop will go to e3. That's sort of part of White's plan. He doesn't mind if you trade on e3 and I have to take back with my f pawn. It, it does open the f file. I do get doubled pawns, but it is an extra central pawn. So normally that's not a big issue. And OK, sometimes we have the maneuver, as we've seen before, uh, you know, g4, and then the knight can come around and jump all the way into f5. Also, you might play knight to h4, and when you're not in a pin, play the move f4 and get more space on the king side. And black, meanwhile, usually will maneuver his knight to g6, where it still controls the e5 square. And then he can play uh, c6 and d5 and get something going in the center. So a really interesting game. Um, what is interesting about this position that surprised me when I prepared this lecture is the computer actually thinks that black is a little bit better here, which I don't know if I agree with that. It seems like pretty equal. It's a really balanced game. So uh, both sides you know, have, have nothing really to complain about here. So that's the GLEC system. All right, so we'll go back once again to the starting position. And we'll talk about the other two most common ways of playing. Uh, we'll actually save the Scotch Four Knights for last, because there's a game that I want to show that uh, made a big impression on me when I saw it live. And we'll talk about the main main line, which is bishop to b5. And now it's the Spanish Four Knights. So it's a lot like a Rui Lopez, only these two knights have you know, been moved to these squares. And normally, the knight in the Rui Lopez doesn't go to c3. Normally, the knight is back on b1, where it can go to d2, to f1, to g3, to uh, f5 here. Um, he still might get there via another route. But OK, it's an interesting way to play. And the most common reply is bishop to b4. And we have sort of a double Roy Lopez. I do want to mention the possibility, however, of playing knight to d4. This is an interesting move to really try to imbalance the game. And this is the Rubenstein counter gambit. If you take on e5, which is not very popular, black can play queen to e7. And due to some pressure on the e file, you should be able to swap a bunch of pieces and achieve an equal game. So white will often in this position uh, try for a little bit more. And you did attack my bishop. So usually they just move their bishop back. All right, makes enough sense. And black continues in the spirit of the gambit, bishop to c5. So OK, now I will take this. And if you, if you castle, white already has to be really careful on this next move here. Uh, turns out castling is actually already a mistake. And now suddenly white is in a very bad position. And we'll see that. It doesn't really look like, OK, you have all these guys. You have a queen that might be able to come in later. Uh, you're about to play d6 and get your bishop into the game. Do you really have an attack, though? It's hard to see it. But after d6, uh, if you go back to f3, then you have to worry about this pin, which is going to be really annoying, because he's going to shatter your, your pawns over there. So more commonly, they go to d3, attacking the bishop. Looks pretty good. But now black has a winning attack. So I'll, I'll once again see if uh, the audience can find it. This is a little bit tougher. And uh, at home, you can go ahead, pause your video, see if you can find it as well. Nothing? It. Yeah, it's quite tough. Uh, so in this position, there's a very strong move. The first move that you should play is bishop to g4, attacking the queen. You really can't play f3 because I have so many discoveries that win. So OK, fine. I'll just move to e1. And now here's the, the really all-star move that you need to find to win the game here. Ah. ah. You want to say some random move? Maybe it's right. Is it knight takes c2? Knight takes c2. It's probably not the best okay. move. OK, never mind. OK. OK. Yeah, we're just joking. Just <clears throat> All right, we got an all-star move here. You see it? White? Yep, it's, a, it's black to move. Knight to f3. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, knight to f3. Uh, which is a very strong sacrifice. So if you take here, black takes back. And surprisingly, you have no way of stopping the threats of knight to g4 and queen to h4, where you'll be threatening to mate here, as well as sometimes you have some threats to come down and mate on g2. 
and you can try to figure this out for yourself, but there's absolutely no defense to the attack. So it's a, yeah, it's a very surprising way, but you can see if you play this variation, you can get into a trouble really fast for white if you don't know what you're doing and you get uh, caught off guard. So uh, we'll go back. And yeah, so more common, white shouldn't castle here. Uh, he should just attack the bishop. And when the bishop goes back, e5, which forces the knight to sort of an awkward square. He's got to go back to the clumsy e8. And now after castling, you get a, oh, sorry, actually, I think, yeah, knight to d5 might also be the, the move here to go get that bishop. But you get a position in which, uh, you know, you're up a pawn as white, but you have sort of awkward problems with getting some of your pieces out, and some of your pieces are not on the ideal squares. So black should still get a lot of pressure, and I think this is probably equal, but it it's, should be more enjoyable to play this as black, at least in my opinion. You know, some people, they like to be up pawns. But uh, it's, it's a comfortable position for black, so you might want to consider playing this way if you face the four knights often enough. But we, uh, we'll go back here, and we'll go back to the main, main line, the main, main line. And this is a version of the, of the four knights that's really, really boring and dull. And so that's why a lot of people, they just think the four knights, ooh, super boring, uh, never going to play it because they, they know the main, main line. And here, both sides castle, and then both sides go like this. And there's, there's so many ways to uh, play. For example, after you bishop to g5, uh, not the only plan, but one plan for black to try to imbalance the game is to take the knight. And now he has a, a very interesting, you know, not the most common way of dealing with this pin. Black's big problem in the main line is, okay, you gotta deal with this pin. Uh, do we really want to, you know, kick the bishop away by moving all of our pawns? Well, probably not. So there is a unique maneuver of bringing a knight to e6 to make sure that bishop has to go away. So for example, queen to e7, and white can prepare to start pushing in the, the, right in the center. Uh, of course, he could take here and get a super ultra drawish line. But uh, okay, if he plays for a little bit more, then you get this maneuver, you play in the center, and uh, you can attack our bishop. So, yeah, so very, very interesting. And now you're going to like the, the most popular moves here. So watch white's next two moves. Uh, very often, this bishop will retreat all the way. There's not a, a whole lot of better squares. If you go to e3, you might get attacked later with uh, knight to g4. So not the optimal square. I mean, d2 doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it is playable, actually. Uh, so OK, the bishop goes back to c1, nice and safe. And not the only move, uh, but black often plays the move c5 in these variations. And white will try to keep the tension for as long as possible, and only if necessary play the move d5. Because after you play d5, you really might start to feel the effect of the doubled pawns over here. But uh, the most common move here for white bishop to f1. So get your bishops out there and then bring them all back. That's, that's how you play good chess. And all right, so let's put like one more move here for black. And you know, there's a couple ways to play it. There's actually some interesting games that have been played in this variation. And one common plan is g3, and then you get to play for f4. And you try to get a lot of space over there. Um, before you do all this, you might have to play the move d5. And black's just going to try to keep a lot of pressure in the center and eventually get stuff going on the queen side. And so this is a, a very interesting way to play. But uh, we'll go back. And I want to look at a, a different line that's a little bit more exciting. And that's the Scotch Four Knights. So again, this is sort of like a Scotch, but both players have already agreed to put their knights on c3 and f6. And OK, usually they take. And we'll look at the most common move, which is to take back, which is the obvious move. But I do want to mention the possibility of the Belgrade Gambit. And somebody mentioned that they wanted to see this, which is kind of one of the reasons I decided to show this whole variation. But then as I was sort of going over what I would want to cover if we went over this Gambit, I realized this is going to have to be its own lecture. Because you know there's so much that can go on here. There's already four very common moves. And that's uh, bishop to e7, knight to b4, and both knight captures. So hopefully we will get to go over this. There's probably going to be some month where we just go over gambits. And uh, this will definitely be, be one of those that goes into there. So 
very exciting. Um, but we're going to look at the main, main move here. And in the game that we're going to look at today, in just a minute here, we'll look at the move that keeps it sort of an independent territory here, bishop to c5. The most common approach is to play bishop to b4, and now we've transposed into a well-known line of the scotch. So from here, uh, you've, you play typically continues with uh, taking the knight. So he is threatening already to take your e4 pawn because of the pin. So typically, you take, and then you protect your pawn, and you get a position like this, uh, where, OK, they get to undouble, and everybody castles, and you get your bishop out. And you know stuff like this tends to happen. And black can go back to e7. He can also go back to d6. And it's a well-known line from the scotch, so you can expect to see that a whole lot. But uh, we're going to get to our, our main game here, and we're going to see a slightly different line. All right, so this is the game between Kramnik and Aronian from 2012. And it was played in April of 2012 which was two months before my son was born. So I used to be able to watch full tournaments. Uh, so I was watching this whole thing. It was a really great match. It was Aronian versus Kramnik. They played six games. And you could tell from the beginning they both really wanted to win. They both took lots of risks in all the games. And so it was a very fun one. You know, They could have just agreed to both be really boring, um, but they didn't. It was a really fun event. And Aronian ended up uh, winning it, even though he didn't win this game. So it was round three. Kramnik was behind a point. He really wanted to win. And in a surprise move, I mean, when you're playing for a win, you don't expect to see the four knights, especially from Kramnik, who usually plays d4 or knight f3 on move one. But he did. And another surprise, he played the scotch four knights. So probably just to get his opponent out of prep and get some, some position here. And now bishop to c5. OK. And he played the, the main move in this position, which is bishop to e3. It's quite possible to take this knight. This will also lead to typical scotch lines, a uh, position like this, you can imagine. So this also was a, a possible move. But the most popular move here is bishop to e3, which already sets up a little, little trick. Uh, white is hoping to take this knight, attacking the queen, and exposing an attack on c5. So there's already a threat. So the bishop has to go back. Now he's nice and safe. And from here, he did sort of an unusual plan, something that had never been seen at the top level. And there's almost no grandmaster games with this move. But he played queen to d2. And so his plan is to castle queenside and to play f3 and then get sort of a pawn attack. And so it, it reminds me sort of of the Yugoslav attack in the Sicilian dragon or an English attack in the Nidorf where you, you, know, you get this pawn formation in your castle queen side, and you start rushing these pawns down the board to checkmate your opponent. Only the difference would be in the Sicilian, this pawn would be on e7. And then we'd be asking ourselves how the bishop got on b6. And we'd probably think that we were watching a scholastic tournament. So here, the pawn structure is slightly different, but it's the same idea. And so he castled, castles. And he put a lot of pressure on the center with rook to e8. So OK, f3, this was my plan. And black got to play a, tick, a typical liberating move, d5. So it's looking pretty good for black so far. Uh, you pretty much have to take my pawn. You can't let me take on e4. So I'll take, take back. And it looks like we're going to get some trades. And black's going to get his bishop out. And everything's fine. But already an interesting decision here. Bishop to g5, attacking the queen. So so what will black do here? He actually played an astounding move. Um, you probably don't want to play the move f6, even though it might be playable. You might be able to get to an end game where you're, you're slightly worse, but maybe you can survive. Because after this move, uh, you're really weakening the king. So a move like bishop to c4 becomes really strong. And uh, OK, you got to. Do something so you can take my knight. I'll take threatening discoveries. So you have to get out of that. And amazingly, even if you get to this end game where you give this guy away before taking on b6, and we trade all the stuff, 
and you take here, and I don't let you play rook a1, you might get to some end game where black is clearly worse because he has more weaknesses, but it is a rook end game, so these are notoriously drawn. So, I mean, you could have played this way as black, but it's obviously not the end game you want to play against Kramnik. Uh, so, okay, I doubt he ever considered f6 very seriously. Another possible move is knight d to e7, but uh, white should get a slightly better position just by trading, and after you trade queens, you can play knight to d5, you're going to pick up the bishop pair and have a slight advantage, but okay, certainly that was a, a playable option. But he played, in this position, the much more amazing knight takes c3, ignoring the threat to the queen. So it's a queen sacrifice, uh, and white accepted it. And now black takes on d1. So for the moment, he has a knight and a rook for the queen, but everything's hanging. So you get this incredibly difficult position to calculate correctly. Uh, there's so much stuff going on. Uh, but just to illustrate one way white could already go really wrong here is if you take on d1, and after rook takes d8, you play a move like c3. And in this position, there's lots of really complicated ways for black to get an advantage. But perhaps the simplest to understand is to take and take with your bishop. Now your bishop is going to get to go to a nice safe square. You can play a move like c5, protect your bishop, and really control the dark squares for the rest of the game. So in a position like this, black would be easily better. So you got to be really careful already as white. And so in the game, if we go back, he played bishop takes c7. And black took back. And uh, yeah, again, you got to be kind of careful. Because if you take on d1, what would uh, black play in this position? Got a little tactic here. There's all sorts of little tactics that both players uh, had to see throughout this game. Eh, no idea. Okay. Bishop f4 check. Forcing the king over. And now you can take on d4. The point being that you, you can't take the knight or this move will be disastrous. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of ways to go wrong. So both players really had to care, uh, calculate carefully. So here, he instead took on c6. All right. And now he had to know about this move knight to e3. And again, white can get into a lot of trouble if he doesn't play the right move here. A move like knight to d4, which seems normal, my knight was attacked, if you move it, it actually runs into bishop to f4, which is a, a pretty big problem for you. So he's threatening some discoveries to win the queen. So even if you get your king out of the way, he can take on f1. And OK, you can't really take this because, again, the rook comes to the back rank. So there's all sorts of possible problems in this position that he had to sort out. So white played again a really amazing move. So black is happy, like, OK, if I just get to take your knight next, uh, you don't have a way to prevent bishop to f4, then you know he's, he's thinking he's doing pretty good. But now the amazing move, bishop to b5. The point being, if you take, and he did, that now you get to fork the pieces. Uh, you fork two rooks. Um, interesting enough, this move is no longer effective. Notice how now the bishop's gone, so we don't have to worry as much about back rank issues. And so you can even play a move like check, and then wherever the king goes, play g3, and now white is completely winning. So obviously black couldn't have taken the knight, because then he would have to worry about back rank issues. So yeah, a lot of complicated things going on. So instead he decides to take, and white takes back. Okay. So the queen is attacked. She's going to go somewhere. And there was all sorts of possible queen moves here that lead to really complicated lines. Um, but the move that he played was fine. Queen to d4. And soon I'm going to you know, go get one of your rooks. So he developed his bishop. And OK, we took the rook on a8. OK, simple enough. And now black could easily just take back on a8, which 
perhaps he was expecting. But he played uh, the more complicated move, bishop to b6. And Kramnik just went back to d3. Uh, so one question I remember I had during the game, it was really fun watching this live. I was trying to figure out, well, what happens if the, the queen protects the bishop? You know, that seems like it would be good. But now there's a really, really complicated drawing line that's like super computer-ish. Uh, but okay, he could have just seen that black gets enough compensation after this check. And you must go to d1. Uh, I'll give you a, a little one. A little tactic here that hopefully even the audience can see. Or the king yeah, right. So a little fork here. So, okay, that's unplayable. Instead, king goes to d1. And now, after this capture, also like rook to d8 is also possible and black gets compensation. But, okay, forcing the king to the e file. So, black or white has a king and a queen on the e file. Black has a rook there. So, some interesting stuff can happen after you attack the queen. You can go back, and there's all sorts of, you know, bishop discoveries that might lead to crazy complications. And so, yeah, you can play, like, bishop to e3, and then it's, like, an incredible drawing line that I doubt they, they saw. But I'm assuming, even if he saw a position like this, he's like, yeah, black clearly has some compensation here. Uh, and just in the fact that the pieces are, are not well coordinated for white, and, you know, his, all his pieces are going to keep getting attacked. So... He decided, okay, I'm not going to play queen to e4, you know, a nice uh, practical decision. So he just put the queen back, and black decided, okay, now I can take the bishop. And let's see, so you do have three pieces for the queen, which in theory that's, you know, better for the three pieces, at least in general. But white has a huge trump here, and that's, he has a three on one over on the queen side. Which means he has a definite plan in the future. He's, his pawns are going to go like this. That's his plan. And it's not really easy to see how black will ever make progress in this game. He doesn't have any you know, super big plan that he can come up with. And so white was really patient from here on out. It was a really instructive way to, to play. Just rookie one, get your piece into the game. You're threatening now to take the, the bishop and remove the defender over c4. So after this, the queen moved. And it's, it's not really obvious how black's going to make any serious progress here. And then he played a really strange move. G5. And this was something that both players did a lot in this match. They kept playing G5 or G4 in positions like this. And sometimes it was really good, and sometimes it's just weakening. Here, it's just sort of weakening the king side. It's, it's not the best move, but okay, he's trying to get a little space over there. And now white can, at any moment, he can play a move like h4 and try to undermine the center in there. All right, getting a phone call somewhere. Uh, but okay, instead white was really, really patient in this game. First he played c3 just to get some control over d4, make sure none of your pieces get to go to that square. And after uh, further moves, again, you can play h4, but he's like, you know, why not just, just take my time, rule out anything going to d2. Very patient. Black has nothing to do. Uh, and now, okay, h4 again, or the much more patient g3, and then he's going to play f4, f5. So, yeah. Okay, black's going to, you know, try to cramp these pawns over on the queen side. Here's the plan. We get f5 in. Um, and, okay, yeah, again... Queen to d3, pinning the pieces. And now b3. So, yeah, black's best advised to trade. You want to get as few pawns over there as possible. And after the knight moves away, okay, the, the computer line here might not be the best line. So this, already, this is a pretty complicated position. Uh, he's trying to get the b3 pawn. And if he gets rid of these pawns, even if it costs him a little bit of material, white's real practical advantage of pushing his majority would end. So the computer wants to play queen to b5, but black maybe has a fortress after knight to b3 and knight to d4, which, you know, he trades his knight to get those two pawns out of the way. And even if you end up trading these rooks, 
then, okay, you still might have a hard time breaking through here. There's three on three that you have to break through, and he has two bishops. So this might be a really hard position to defend. So he decided to play a much more practical and human move to eliminate the possibility of a fortress. Rook to e8. So sacrificing an exchange to get this bishop, and now we're protecting b3, and so we can keep pushing our pawns. All right, the queen was attacked. He's got to go somewhere where he's protecting b3. So, okay, he went to b5. And after this, now he's, he's ready to start pushing. Uh, sorry, actually, he gets his king up. Okay, very nice. And uh, all right, now we can push. And we can push. And now, okay, the rook goes over. And now a nice little move, g4, just uh, cementing the position and making sure there's no little tricks. And maybe perhaps he's, uh, he's hoping that on a move like c5, maybe he can sacrifice both of his pieces or something. But uh, he had to move. Now here come the pawns. In goes the queen. Keep going. He takes the bishop. Now it's OK, because even if you get b5, uh, he played a nice little move here. Queen to e5, and now this rook is eternally pinned. So that piece is just stuck, and after just a couple more moves here, uh, black gave it up. So yeah, there's really nothing to do. Even if you play knight to c6, for example, we just move our queen away. We can bring our king in as much as we want, and black should run out of moves. So all right, he's like, all right, had enough. Uh, you know, you can always, White can always wait as much as he wants, and he'll be able to push his pawn when he's ready. Uh, but so, yeah, a very interesting and exciting game. Uh, it was a lot of fun to watch live, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it at home. Uh, as always, keep sending in your submissions for what you guys want to see next week. Uh, make sure you hit like, uh, subscribe, you know, all the good stuff. All right, thank you.